What's up, Dream Team? Another day of 100 push ups. Grateful to be alive. Let's get it. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I have for you guys for today, at least. Uh, I've got to head to work here in a bit. But uh, let's get our 100 push ups done and uh, carry on. Carry on. Carry on, Deleon. between the companies that have this kind of patent they get to hurt the customer. Let's continue. The idea these patents will rely on against home treatment or like this may not see a generic alternative for 37 years due to 49 patents issued. So now we can go through a lot of different stories. I can give you 20 other stories like this. Let's take a look at how these pharmaceutical companies go about extending the patent past the company that they have. Number one, ever green. This practice involves making slight modifications to an existing drug, such as changing its formulation, dosage, or doing new method, and then patenting the new version. The company then encourages healthcare providers to prescribe the new version, even though the original drug still may be effective. Number two, patent term extension. In some jurisdictions, companies can apply for patent term extension if they can demonstrate that they have invested significant time and resources in developing the drug. This extension is typically granted to compensate for the time spent in research and regulatory approval processes. Number three, data exclusivity. Pharmaceutical companies often receive a period of data exclusivity during which they have exclusive rights to the clinical trial data they've generated. This can delay the entry of generic drugs into the market as other manufacturers must wait until the exclusivity period expires to access the data and develop their own versions. Pretty creative what these guys are doing, like to keep it extending another 10 years and 10 years. Again, imagine 40 years no competition, but there's four other ways they do this well. Number four, patent clustering. Companies may file multiple patents around a single drug covering various aspects such as manufacturing processes, formulations, and even potential uses. Five, pay for delay agreements. Sometimes pharmaceutical companies enter into agreements with a generic drug manufacturer to delay the introduction of a generic version of a drug. In those deals, the brand name drug manufacturers compensate the generic manufacturers for not launching their product for a specified period. Can you imagine this? Look, we'll give you 50 million bucks. Just leave it. 
Please don't compete with us. That's another way they're able to extend that. Next one, orphan drug exclusivity. In some cases, drugs developed to treat rare diseases, orphan drugs, receive extended market exclusivity to encourage companies to invest in research and development for these conditions. And last but not least, legal challenges. Pharmaceutical companies may engage in litigation to enforce their patents or challenge the validity of generic composition. How can you do that? You're sitting on all this cash. You can just keep people in court, be litigious, scare the crap out of everybody, and be able to extend your patents. You may say, Pat, these are all anecdotes. Give me a break. I mean, show us some data. What happens when these guys lose their patents? Is there a dramatic price drop off the following year? Let's take a look. What happens the year when their patent expires? What happens to the price of the drug the following year? Here's some examples. Data show prescription drug costs declined by 90% in some cases when the patent expires and competition enters the market. It is estimated that generic entry typically leads to an, on average, 80% market share loss. Here's an example. Lipitor. This is a Pfizer cholesterol lowering medication. The patent expired in 2011. Take a look at the revenues there. Blue, the dark blue is US. The light blue is international. Do you notice how in 2001, it keeps climbing. 2002, three, four, five. They're doing incredible for themselves. But the patent expires in 2011. Look at the drop off. They go from the dark blue, which is roughly a little over four and a half billion dollars in the US, and they drop to $800 million all the way down to $76 million when others can sell the product for pennies on a dollar. And then other consumers says, I can afford to buy this. How many people in America right now are dealing with high cholesterol? This drug can save a lot of people's lives, but many cannot afford to pay for it. 20 year patent, 30 year patent, 40 year patent. Is that a good thing? Let's look at another example here. Next year, a drug for gastro reflux disease. Okay, so the patent for this expired in 2014. Take a look at this here. What happened to that? 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, they're doing pretty good. Look what happens in 2015, the euro drops up. You see that massive drop off from the revenues, 3.6 billion up to 2.5 billion. All of a sudden, it goes to 1.2 billion. That's a 75% discount, 70% discount simply by allowing the market to compete for this. So now some people chat with me and say, Pat, ah, but if that company doesn't come out with that patent, nobody else has it. I totally get it. I have a solution for it, but let's look at one other example here. Let's take a look at the next one here. So right, well, let's say prescription for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. The patent expires in 2008. In the search for epic bargains, one Well, before I even show you the numbers, I want to prepare you. You're going to be shell-shocked, okay? You're going to be shell-shocked. See how their numbers look from 2006 to 2011. 2006, 3.4 billion. Then you go to 4 billion, 4.4 billion, 4.8 billion, 5.3 billion. 2011, they do $5.8 billion. Patent expires. Next year, they drop off to 2.8 billion, 1.6 billion. Eventually, in 2021, it ends up becoming 92 billion. You know what the savings is and how much it dropped off from 5.8 billion to 92 million? Ready? 98.5% drop off. Let me say this one more time. 98.5% drop off. I'm selling this drug to you for $1,000 versus now it's not $98, it's $9.85. That's the equivalent of what just happened because the patent expired. This is the kind of stuff that frustrates a lot of different people. Matter of fact, let's take a look at the top 10 most expensive drugs in America today. Take a look at this. So first of all, I'm gonna butcher some of these names, so brace for impact, but let's take a look at this top 10. Number one, Zolgen Smug, $2.125 million per year for a course of treatment, and this is to treat spinal muscular atrophy, a rare childhood disorder. Folks, $2.1 million per year. Hmm. Number two, Zokinvi, $1,073,000. This is treatment for hutchinson guilford porphyria syndrome, a rare genetic disease that causes premature aging. Number three, Danielsa, $1,011,000 per year. This is to treat neuroblastoma in the bone or bone marrow of pediatric and adult patients. Number four, Tim Track, nine seventy five. dollars Okay, we're at 60, so I'm watering my plants and doing a couple little things here and there. But I mean, that kind of should show you that there's no excuses, you know what I mean? You might be busy, but uh, you prioritize what is more important for you, uh, and it's demonstrated through your actions. So, uh, I mean, there's a couple little things that I have to do, a lot of things that I have to do, but uh, I feel like uh, showing this 100 push-ups and that it's possible uh, yeah, you know, even with a busy schedule, and if you're not as busy, then it's even more possible.
Uh, but anyways, hopefully it gets some of you guys to get doing the same thing. It is used to treat urea cycle disorders, and if it's left untreated, they can lead to confusion, coma, or even death. Keep this in mind. I'm recognizing all the scientists and doctors and pharmaceutical companies that invented this. They ought to get credit for getting it, and I do believe they deserve to have a patent because that's the part of the incentive. But 20 years and an extending another 20 years, that's when you know you're not doing good for society. So how did these laws go into effect? Well, first one was in 1790. This is during the George Washington era of being a president, the Patent Act of 1790. This was the first patent statute enacted in the United States, established the basic framework of granting patents and protect inventors' rights, which later extended to the pharmaceutical industry. This leads to 1984 Hatch and Waxman Act. Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah, Republican, and Congressman Harry Waxman from California, Democrat, came together and said, this 20 years is too long. Can we bring it down to 14 years? That's what they did. They passed it to 14 years. The whole concept behind this was as a pathway for generic drugs to come to market more quickly and at a lower cost. So good. They help it save six years. Great. Consumers want you. So how long did that last 14 years? Only 10 years. Because in 1994, GATT and TRIPS, GATT stands for General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade, and TRIPS stands for Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. They raised it back up to 20 years, and the law was implemented in 1995. So that, again, is, did this really increase prices? Let's take a look at history since 1980. So 1980 to today, prices have nearly 8x. This chart here shows it's 2016, 2017. It's nearly 8x. If you look at 1984, the Hatch-Raxman Act, which lowered it to 14 years, there wasn't really a major spike in per capita spending on retail prescription drugs. But if you look at 1994, Jack and Trips Act, look what happens after this. Skyrocketed. Pharmaceutical companies started competing even more because now they can extend about 14 years to 20 years and beyond. So before I give my solution on what I think they can do here, let me kind of give you both sides of the argument. The guys that say, well, we should keep it 20 years. There's nothing wrong with 40 years. This is actually good. And the ones that are saying, listen, this is insane. Why are we doing it this far? Here's those that are saying it is good to have a long patent. This is their argument. Number one, incentivizing innovations. Fine. Number two, Promoting drug access and availability, fair. Number three, protecting intellectual property rights. Great, those are three points that you have. Now let's look at against it. Here's what the arguments are. Number one, high drug prices and access barriers. Two, monopolistic practices and lack of competition. Agree. Number three, limited innovation and repurposing. Number four, publicly funded research and development. And number five, ethical considerations. So now, some people say, Pat, this is crazy that I'm looking at the drama, what happens after the patent. Who can do anything about it? Congress, the way you vote, and an ex-president. Why don't they talk about it as much? Here's why. Most lobbyists, these mainstream media companies get tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars every year from Big Pharma, because remember, there's only two countries in the world that allows pharmaceutical companies to advertise on TV. The U.S. is one of them, and I believe New Zealand passed an act in 1980 that allowed them to All right. All the other We're at 90, no, 80. Yeah, 80. That's right. So why don't more people talk about this? Because they're not going to get political campaign contributions, and a lot of these guys are not going to go on TV to host them because their enemy that they're going after is the one that's funding their companies in many cases. But let's not be that skeptical. Let me give you my idea. So you know the whole concern is like, let's put 20 years, and let's not allow all the other guys to do anything else. This is ridiculous. Let us protect our patent. We came up with this product. What if we did this? What if you, who come out with the patent, no problem. You get finance. Go, you're in the market. Do whatever you want to do with the price. Dictate the price. We don't agree with it, but thank you for creating a drug like this that's saving a lot of people's lives. Go ahead and do it. But guess what? Five years from now, you can lease your patent to any other company, and they get to sell it at any price that they want to, but you get 10% for whatever they sell it for for 15 years. What does this mean? Let's say you're selling this drug for $1,000, okay? For five years, you can sell it for $1,000. I'm just giving a number to make it easy. Five years later, 20 other people come in and say, hey, we want to sell that drug as well. Here's a 15-year lease, total 20 years. Everything you sell. All right. Let's just bust them out. 100 push, baby. Per one you sell, I get bucks to the company. Well, that's not good because now they make it $1,000. Now you expect them to be okay for selling it for $200? Yeah, but now 20 companies, 20 companies are not selling that drug. 
Okay. That's a hundred. Do it for you. Do it for me. I do it for we, the people. Dream Team. Let's go.